Today we are pleased to introduce Matthew J. Priggy as part of the Wisconsin Historical Museum's History Sandwiched In lecture series. The opinions expressed today are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Historical Society or the museum's employees. Matthew J. Priggy is a freelance author and historian from Milwaukee and the host of What Made Milwaukee Famous, a weekly local history segment on WMSE 91.7. <coughs> His work has been featured in both local and national publications and has won multiple awards, including the 2013 William Bess Hesseltine Award from the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. Since 2011, he has led sightseeing historical tours of Milwaukee's rivers and harbor for the Milwaukee Boat Line. In 2013, he created the Mondo Milwaukee Boat Tour, an evening historical tour of some of the city's most infamous sites. Uh, the Milwaukee Mayhem is his second book, he writes a history blog for Milwaukee Shepherd Express and has also authored several articles for the Wisconsin Magazine of History. Here today to tell some strange, engaging, and chilling tales from the early and often forgotten times in Milwaukee history, please join me in welcoming Matthew J. Priggy. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Is the sound is good? All corners? Oh, okay. Well. My name is Matthew J. Priggy, and I'm here to talk about my book, Milwaukee Mayhem. Uh, just came out a couple of months ago. I'm going to tell, uh, get into some of the stories here. Also, talk a little bit about the the process. Just talk about the book a little bit. Uh, first off, has anybody gotten it yet? Has anybody read it? <laughs> oh, great! My publisher, awesome. <laughs> She's very familiar with it. Okay, well, to, uh, to let everybody else know, um, this is a collection of short uh, historical stories, uh, some of the, the stranger events in Milwaukee's history. Uh, they're organized into the categories of murder, uh, accidents, disaster, and vice. Um, so why do this, I guess, would be a good question to start off with. Uh, I've always been you know, very interested in Milwaukee's history. I've done a lot of things, uh, written a lot of pieces on it. And I know, uh, over the last several years, I was always coming across these odd items in the newspaper. And I didn't really know what to do with them. So I just was kind of collecting them for a while. And I guess really the, the, the nexus of this book was that uh, the Milwaukee, uh, the Mondo Milwaukee tour uh, that was mentioned a couple moments ago, because um, I do boat tours, sightseeing tours of the city on the, the rivers and the lake. And there are always these things I looked at, these sites, and I knew all this strange stuff that had happened there. But it really wasn't appropriate to drop into the middle of a uh, sightseeing tour. So I, I put them all together, and I put together this weird tour talking about famous murder sites and, and the red light district and things like that. And, and that kind of uh, birthed this idea here to try to, to put these uh, together and I open up the book with uh, talking about the bridge war in Milwaukee and um, some of you might be familiar with that that was uh, basically the way Milwaukee is situated there was an eastern ward and a western ward on each side of the river um, Solomon Juno founded the eastern ward a guy named Byron Kilburn founded the western ward and they had this really odd and intense rivalry early on and it ended, ended up uh, when they started actually building bridges, they, there's this couple month period where each side sort of took turns sabotaging the bridges the other side preferred. And uh, after a couple of weeks, all, I think it was the four bridges, of our four of the five bridges in Milwaukee had been destroyed and they, uh, the people on the east side had, had commandeered a cannon and pointed it at Byron Kilbourne's home. <laughs> and uh, the story is, anybody who's familiar with Milwaukee's history knows this story. And it's always sort of told, um, you know, from the point of view of East versus West. And I, underst I always understood why the two ward founders wanted to, to go to war with each other, because they had a lot of, at stake over this. But the, uh, what got me thinking in terms of, of this, these stories here was just the, the rabble, you know, the people on each side. The people who were actually destroying these bridges and, and uh, mounting cannons at each other. Uh, you know, they'd only been there a few years. Um, this wasn't the... Uh, uh, the Montagues and the Capulets, if you will. This was all people who'd come to this place and just happen to end up on one side of the river or the other. But it got so you know, fevered that they're ready to just actually spill blood over these loyalties that had just kind of developed. And 
And I, I got interested in just that, that rabble, because there's you know, these histories of Milwaukee, either they tell stories of Pacific founding fathers and the business leaders, or uh, more recent ones get into you know, labor movements and civil rights movements, and all that's valuable and all that's good. But I got interested in you know, the people, um, not necessarily the people who were fighting for an eight hour work day, but the people who didn't want to go to work. You know, bums, drunks, prostitutes, uh, thieves, murderers, you know, these people all all lived here too. Um, there was a story in the book on a woman named Rosina George, and she ran a dance hall uh, in the 1870s and was constantly being arrested for running this hall without a permit, because hers is one of the few places in the city where uh, black and white people would drink and dance together. And she also served, um, she had no restrictions on an age. She'd served children in this. There's the noise and just the, the unsightliness of this all. The city kept going after her, but she kept winning these battles. She made, um, you know, the news articles on it say she you know, makes a carpet of the mayor. She walks all over him so regularly. And she became kind of this, <laughs> this folk hero for just doing whatever she wanted to, uh, regardless of what you know, the city officials tried to do to her. And that, you know, she was an interesting, just somebody always stuck with me as, and nobody ever mentions her in a history book, and she was, she was as much a Milwaukeean as the mayor or the president of the Common Council or whoever. Um, so that was it's kind of what I'm, I'm aiming at here. And the, the intro, uh, I use the term orphans of history to describe these people and these stories. Don't really have any, you know, the story of Rosina George, or um, there's another story in here on this rash of suicides, and I think it was 1874. Uh, these aren't necessarily um, important in long term, you know, long scope histories of the city, but they're interesting on their own. And the people in here uh, were very much Milwaukeeans. So I'm going to start out with. Uh, I'm going to read part of one called uh, "In a Violinist's Hands." This is from the murder chapter, and it happened in August 1884. Professor. William Mobius, well-known classical violinist and music instructor, stumbled out of a Grand Avenue gambling parlor, a loaded British bulldog revolver in his pocket and death on his mind. It was just past 2 p.m. on a Sunday. As a child, Mobius had been a musical prodigy, sent to the conservatory at Dresden at age nine and touring Prussia by age 14. He had played in orchestras in France, Spain, and Italy. After immigrating to America, he played in New York City and led his own orchestra in Louisville before returning to tour the grand concert halls of Europe. In 1879, he brought his wife and eight children to Milwaukee. There he taught music and performed with the city's Bach Orchestra, but he also took to gambling. A string of heavy losses forced him into a state of horrid dejection. Nearing the foot of the Grand Avenue Bridge, he pulled the gun from his pocket and fired a single shot towards the dirt. The professor was not familiar with firearms. He had purchased the weapon and a box of ammunition only an hour earlier from a West Water Street gun shop. The weapon was so foreign to him that he returned to the shop a few minutes later and asked the clerk if he would be so kind as to load it for him. From there, he hastened to Grand Avenue and played his last $10. He lost. The volley into the ground was a practice shot. Satisfied he could operate the piece, he placed it to his chest and squeezed off four shots. The gunfire drew the attention of the midday downtown traffic. A crowd had already began, begun to form around Mobius when a nearby police detective placed the still breathing, greatly stunned, and entirely unharmed professor under arrest. <laughs> the gun Mobius placed to his heart with the intention of ending his life had been filled with blanks. The clerk who had sold Mobius the pistol was so disturbed by the professor's peculiar behavior in his shop that he had pocketed the bullets Mobius had purchased and loaded the gun with harmless imitation ammunition. <laughs> At the police station, Mobius said he appreciated the clerk's deception and that he was glad to be alive. He expressed concern over, he, uh, he also expressed concern over a small bundle of letters he had dropped in a mailbox just before his failed suicide. <laughs> They were addressed to various mem uh, family members and friends explaining his plight and detailing his intention of self-murder. Before his wife collected them at the station, he asked if anything could be done to prevent the letters from being delivered. He was told there was not. It was expected they would be delivered sometime the next week. So that's uh, kind of an example of what, what you'll find here. Uh, 
This one, I think it probably has the happiest ending of all the <laughs> stories in the murder chapter. Um, but again, you know, Professor Mobius is something, you know, it's very, very hard to find any information on him, but he was, you know, for this one day, one of the most famous people in town. Uh, and of course, I've gotten, uh, uh, most of the, the sources from this book come from the, the old newspapers. Uh, they have proven to be, uh, they proved to be an incredible um, uh, resource for, for putting these together. It kind of started off uh, just as the easiest place to go. Um, the old journal, uh, the old Milwaukee Sentinel um, papers for most of the 1800s, they're all indexed very, very meticulously. So I was able to pick out every murder that they reported on there. And then through the Google News Archive, I picked out a lot more and, and you just get into pulling with threads. And, it, and it, it, this newspaper, using the newspaper, started out as a necessity, but then as I got further into the book, that was, um, I made the, the conscious decision to stick almost exclusively with the newspapers because uh, I wanted to pre present the stories in the way people would have absorbed them at the time. Some of these, um, you know, they don't necessarily have an ending because some of these stories didn't really, didn't really have endings. They just sort of faded from public view. Um, and also the newspapers back at that time were really, uh, really great just, just to read. This, the, they did this really florid and graphic prose and did not shy away from anything. Uh, really, even the, I mentioned the, the one about the suicides, you know, they'd print, um, they'd report on suicides and print the addresses where the people lived and they'd talk to the neighbors and figure out the reasons as to why this happened. And um, it, working that into this as well, it, it kind of, the, the interest in this book, I think, is nothing, nothing new because there was, you know, people got it every day back then. There's a very gossipy style to the newspaper. And um, that also sort of backed up this idea that these people were, uh, in my head, that these people were significant in their own time because they were, and even the respectable people, the uh, city fathers and business leaders and everything, they got the same newspapers you can find in the archives now and they would have been, I, I think, probably just as interested in this stuff as anybody else. Um, so I'm gonna read a part of a, a story, another story that I think really highlights just how the newspapers talked back then. And the, uh, I thought of it as, as a sort of trashy and alarmist poetry of the uh, 19th century uh, Milwaukee media. So this one is a story called Mashers and, um, from May 1881. Uh, so it starts out where there's a, two girls walking home and these two young flirts approach them and ask them to, to walk them to their front door. And uh, the father of the girls is terribly offended. And the, um, this is actually from a letter to the editor to, to warn about mashing. And they said that the father of these two girls uh, was preambulating the streets with vengeance depicted in his countenance and a rawhide in his coat sleeve, looking for these two guys. The insult upon the girls was the work of mashers, young male flirts who threw their affection at female passersby in the main commercial districts of the city. The look of the masher was one meant for an unmistakable indication of his intentions. He wears a jaunty little hat on one side of his head, the sentinel wrote, grasps a slender cane, and always carries the paraphernalia of his guild in the shape of showy handkerchiefs, buttonhole bouquets, and other fanc fascinating and fancy trifles. By early evening, the paper claimed the streets were so thick with such brutish looking and fantastical apes dressed in the very latest agony that women could not venture out unaccompanied without being subject to their insults. The typical habit of these dainty, dialing, dainty darlings of the dive was to sally forth beginning in the late evening, uh, late afternoon along downtown's Grand Avenue and Broadway. Finding a pretty girl, the masher would follow a few paces behind. Once he was confident, no male companion was nearby, he would quicken his pace and begin his pitch. But these lifted hats and blown kisses of the masher usually had no effect on the more respectable women of the city. They do not reap much of a harvest, the sentinel claimed, until after the supper is over, the dishes are cleaned, and the housework done up, when the cooks, servants, and chambermaids come out to have flirtations with their social vis-a-vis. -vis. Writing with a decidedly alarmist tone, one article was titled, Kill the Masher. The Sentinel noted that summer was very near and that soon the mashers at the lakefront park would be as thick as gnats at a country cow yard. The problem, the paper asserted, 
would get worse before it got better. <laughs> so that's uh, that kind of, well that one's very, one of my favorites, just the, the source material for that. But uh, there was, that's, that's how they wrote back then. And um, it was, uh, you know, like I said, it was just the proof that these, um, just the fact that these articles were so prevalent back then and then covered this huge period of time, really from um, you know, the 1850s up into the, the 20s and that by the teens, it's, it's pretty well faded away. But uh, to me, that's proof that this is what the reading public really wanted. When you picked up a newspaper, you went to you know, the gossip column or the, uh, the crime page. Um, but you know the, the two I've read so far are kind of a, a light on the lighter side of what's in the book. There's also some kind of gruesome stuff, um, and you know there were some decisions I had to make uh, in terms of that of, of you know what to what to cover, what to include, what not to include, uh, the time span for the book, uh, the Cream City's first century, so uh, 1840s to 1940s. That was sort of a um, you know less so to to put it into a 100 year time span and more to kind of give some space between uh, anything that might happen here and the present. I thought, uh, especially with some of the more uh, gruesome stories, it might be a little more palatable if there's a little more time between the reader and the event. Um, but uh, also I, I was, that was kind of strange. I actually found myself sort of toning things down in places from the way they described it in the newspapers. Um, one uh, interview I had done, someone asked me about, uh, you know, in terms of how race is addressed in the book, how stories, you know, there are some stories that talk about African Americans in Milwaukee, but the uh, person said, well, there's nothing about the native populations there. And that was, aside from there just not being a lot of material for that, that was, you know, it also these newspapers at the time, they wrote very condescendingly about non-white people and even, you know, within white people. Um, you know, certain immigrant groups. Uh, so there was, you know, there's that balance of trying to be true to the source material and trying to you know, present this well and in kind of a, the raw style that they used, but also to, um, you know, just not, not be too much of a downer in any area, and especially with the way that the, the you know, minorities were addressed. That was just, um, not that that's not worth looking at, but just not how the direction I wanted to go here. Um, and also, the next story I'm going to read is uh, about a woman found in the lake, a uh, dead body. And this one gets to, again, kind of that style of journalism, but also it talks, uh, it speaks to another theme that I was going at in the book, was just how the public reacted to these things as they happened. Uh, crime scenes, disaster scenes. Um, you'll see people on the internet talking one way or another about appropriate places to take selfies. You know, whether this historical site is okay or this is not, or funerals or whatever. Um, just reading about people, specifically people in Milwaukee back then and how they reacted when a, when a building burned down or when somebody died and there was you know, just a murder in the street or something. I can assure you if they had had the means, there would have been selfies at these crime scenes from those people. This is not, uh, it's not a new phenomenon. And if anything, I think people have gotten uh, better about it. But this one is called the woman. <clears throat> excuse me, the woman at the breakwater from June 1898. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, basically, there's a man who rents a, a uh, paddle boat from a lakefront stand. He has a woman with him. They go out into the lake. They come back a few hours. The woman's not with him. Uh, he says he left her at the beach. A uh, body washes up a few days later, they find out, or they, they determine that it was uh, this unknown man who took the woman out into the lake, murdered her, and tied a horse hitching weight around her waist and tossed her in the lake. But if the police had a general idea as to how the crime was committed, they had no clue as to the identities of those involved. Hundreds of Milwaukeeans were drawn to the display of the garments, and I should preface here they uh, so all they had, the body fell apart when they took it out of the water. So the only evidence they had was this horse hitching weight and the clothes, the undergarments that the woman was wearing. And they put them on display at the central police station, hopefully to, to get someone to come forward to, to, uh, to break this case. The hundreds of Milwaukeeans were drawn to the display of the garments, including curious ones who were, in the words of the Milwaukee Sentinel, 
impelled by a morbid interest in gruesome things and inspected the discolored gar garments with an evident pleasure. Scores of tips revealed dozens of women, either Milwaukee residents or visitors, who could not be located by loved ones. One woman feared the departed to be her daughter, whom she had not heard from in some time and was quite, happily mar quite unhappily married to a man who had threatened on several occasions to kill her. Another tip told of a woman who had taken up with a married man. When the situation turned sour, the man told a friend of the woman that he had gave her some money and she had left town. The missing woman's friend suspected he was not telling the truth. One man told police his wife had run off on him and was last known to be living in Milwaukee. He asked for and was given a piece of the lace from the underclothes found on the body. He refused to give his name but promised to return the next day with more information. He was never seen again. A Chicago man made the trip north and said the clothes looked very similar to those owned by his wife, who had walked out on him some time ago. Examining the teeth from the corpse, however, he became convinced the body was not that of his wife. He was fairly unmoved during the process, telling police he was merely curious as to the identity of the body and did not care one whit if his wife was alive or dead. <laughs> Despite the case's publicity, no positive identification of the body was ever made. Three days after the woman at the breakwater was recovered, she was buried in the potter's field at the county poor farm along the south bank of the Menominee River to be forever eulogized as name unknown. And there are, uh, especially through the disaster chapter, there's just this, I didn't even really intend to do it, but reading through these as I was uh, putting them in order, I found that there's this theme that there's always these huge crowds of people who gather around when something goes terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, this one quote that I just love came from a, um, oh, there was a, they were launching a ship in Milwaukee's Inner Harbor, a wooden ship, and uh, when they dropped it into the, uh, the harbor, the water displaced, rushed up onto the shore and knocked over a viewing stand that uh, people were, had crowded onto, and uh, I think two people drowned, but the next day, you know, it was all, everything was in ruins the next day, there were these throngs of people everywhere, and the, the Sentinel uh, quoted a peanut vendor who had set up nearby and was doing very good business, and he described uh, you know, these, these disasters, this interest in it, he called it, and he said, it's an ill wind that blows nobody good, and I think that is uh, really the best way to, to get at just this, you know, this, uh, this interest in these, these awful um, things. So, Dealing with this, there's also, uh, you know, I mentioned that trying to find that balance between, um, you know, what is, what is okay to talk about or what will fit in the book and what won't. And just to share kind of a personal story from this, um, I, you know, doing these, I think there's about 80 stories in the book, but, um, you know, there was some that I left out just because there wasn't room or I didn't really like them. But then there were others that I kind of started on and uh, never completed. And again, when you're finding these, you know, you find the story of, uh, you know, a missing person, and then you look into it, and it turns out to be nothing. But um, about halfway through the process, I was looking for some good kidnapping stories. Because kidnapping stories are, they usually fizzle out. And I found this one of a teenage girl who was kidnapped in, I think it was the 1880s. And it was really interesting because there was, you know, she went missing, and the mother, uh, so there was some suspicious man who'd come to their house the day before and they were looking for this man, they were looking for the woman and the, or the, the girl and they didn't know if she was murdered or if she'd been you know, kidnapped or run away or what. And I was finding, finding this very long trail of articles, much long, longer than you usually find. And I, was, I found one uh, in the, the index, the card catalog, of uh, the, the Sentinel articles. I you know, threw on my, uh, changed around my search terms a little bit and finally found uh, one more article after not being able to find out anything and uh, it was that the girl was found and she was okay and I remember just being like oh <laughs> I was I had a couple seconds there where I was just like oh man <laughs> and yeah it was after you deal with this for so long and I think that might be you know part of the reason that the newspapers were they wrote in the tone that they did because these you know I did this for a few or you know, really intensely for you know, maybe a year, but these guys did this every day, and there's this very, you know, I talked about the gossipy nature of the newspapers, and there was a very um, definite gallows humor uh, that they used. There was one, 
Oh, in the, uh, the, the story about all the, the suicides, there was one that as a man, he hung himself, I think, I don't, I don't, or he, he drowned. But anyway, they had the body, and they, they didn't know who it was, and then a couple people came forward, and they said, oh, it's, it's such and such, we know him. And so they printed you know, the next day that such and such was found dead. He'd killed himself. And uh, a day later, there was a, a news item that said this guy had come forward. He'd taken the train into Milwaukee. He was living somewhere in the outskirts. And he said, well, no, this isn't me. And the, the, <laughs> the Sentinel, they, you know, they mentioned this. Then they closed the article with something like, well, if, he, you know, if he's unable to prove that the corpse is not his, he might be charged with perjury. <laughs> and you know, this is still a story about a suicide, and it's yeah. There was an, there was also another one where um, this is from the 1850s, where they'd found a body in the river, and uh, it was a, it was a gruesome, fairly gruesome murder. Um, no, they they found a head in the river. Excuse me, uh, and they hadn't found the rest of the body. And this is also another one of those where I just wasn't able to follow the story through, really to the end. Um, but the, the, they wrote about the, the boy who was, was boating in the river, he pulled in the head, and then uh, the, the sentinel, they, they closed it by saying, like, well, we weren't able to identify the body. Inquests were not the order of the day, meaning whoever wrote that just didn't feel like going and finding out who it was. Uh, so I think I've got time for, I'm going to do one more, and this one... This is a kidnapping story. It's, uh, it's typical of the kidnapping stories I was able to find, and it's actually one of my, uh, one of my favorites. I think it's a good way to, to try to, uh, to wrap things up, uh, kind of an uplift, if you will. So it's called The Runaways from September 1898. On a street corner near the Wells Street train depot in Chicago, two Milwaukee children approached a police officer. Take us to our Uncle Adam, John Matthews, age 10, told the cop. At his side was his eight-year-old sister, Louisa. When the officer told the kids he had no idea who Uncle Adam was, John offer, offered an alternative. Well, take us to our Aunt Polly then. The pair ended up at the police station. When asked how they had come to be so far from home, John told police they had been kidnapped. According to the boy, the pair had been approached at, the Milwaukee, at Milwaukee's Chicago Northwestern Railroad Depot the big house by the lake, as he put it, by a well-dressed woman who asked them if they would like to take a train ride. They said they would, and she purchased three tickets, loaded them aboard a southbound train, and sat with them all the way to Chicago. Upon arriving in the city, she told them to wait at the depot, left, and never returned. The police contacted the children's frantic parents, who had not seen them since sending them off to Sunday school that morning. Their father, William Matthews, rushed down to Chicago to retrieve the children and sat with them as they recounted their fantastic story to a Milwaukee police detective. The children went on and on about the Chinamen and all sorts of funny people they had seen in Chicago and the crosswoman they had encountered at the Chicago police station who was saying horrid things because she did not like the bread she was given to eat. But their description of the kidnapping was evidently lacking, and both the police and the children's parents agreed that the pair had simply run away. Evidently, John had been punished by his mother for lying the day before and had determined to skip town. Police sent the kids home with their parents, who punished both for their flight to the south. But once again, little John Matthews felt that his penalty was undue. The very next day, he and Louisa again walked to the lakefront depot, boarded a train, and, despite declarations that they did not like the city, disembarked in Chicago. There they once again claimed to have been kidnapped and were held at the police station to await their father. Mr. Matthews had no idea how the children had managed to make the trip twice without paying and without drawing the suspicion of any adults aboard. He told the newspapers that his son was likely next bound for an industrial school. <laughs> and uh, I did bring, I brought one more along, so I think we'll do that one. I've got a couple minutes here at the end and then uh, oh, a little bit of time here and then we'll do some... Uh, some questions before we get to the uh, book signing. Uh, this one is from the Vice chapter. I, didn't, I don't think I read anything from the a couple of, uh, well, the Mashers would have come from the Vice chapter too. But this one's also from um, uh, the Vice chapter. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, charting the, the Vice chapter, there's these alarms at, at uh, you know, these panics 
that kind of happen like clockwork. Basically, um, you know, what's wrong with kids these days? It goes back, uh, probably goes back as far as there have been children, but uh, this one is from January 1922 and it's called With Bells On. The most recent fashion accessory of the Milwaukee flapper was causing concern among school officials in the city. Flappers, a teenaged army of pretty girls with bobbed hair, short dresses, and rouged faces, per the Milwaukee Journal, were known for their slinky sex appeal and alluring perfumes. But this new trend was drawing attention from more than just the eyes and nose. The most chic of the flapper set was now adorning her outfits with small jingling bells whose tinkle accommodates her promenade. By the time these jingling flappers were set loose on summer vacation, the journal was already declaring that 1922 would go down as the year of the great flapper controversy. At 14, they look like grown women did before the war. At 17, they can pass for 24, the paper wrote. If you're a high school boy, you say they have snap and make keen dates, and you are proud to walk down the street with one hanging on your arm. Of course, it was not high school boys who were worrying so loudly about these girls and their snap. The mobility and independence of the flapper seemed to some a fast road bound to ruin. Milwaukee flappers found idols at the movies and dressed to mimic their favorite female stars. They went with boys who drove fast cars, went to dance halls and roadhouses, and spent the money of their companions, or even their own as many worked, on cold drinks and hot jazz. The journal talked to one young girl who had just the night before been out until 3 a.m. in a country roadhouse. The reporter asked if there was any adult supervision to her night out. What did we want of a chaperone, the flapper spat. We knew the boys, and anyway, a girl can take care of herself. The reporter found another girl who was also familiar with the back roads. Do I let the, do the boy, do boys take liberty with, liberties with me? Not so you can notice, she told the man. If I like a boy pretty well, I let him kiss me, and if, I let him kiss me if he wants to, and of course he always wants to. If I don't, if I don't like him, nothing doing. Seeing that the journal man was taken aback by her attitude towards what had once been a fairly verboten subject, she continued, why not? If you like boys, why not let them know it? Why not have a good time as you go along? There'll be trouble enough later on. Any movie will show you that. Despite the somewhat shocking behavior the journal man uncovered, he was less alarmed by the flapper than others. So why not let the flappers flap if they want to, he asked his readers. Their momentary eccentricities probably are far more harmless than we choose to believe. As far as the flappers' jingling dresses, school officials w said they would probably move to ban bells from acceptable student clothing. Their accompaniment, it said, had a tendency to distract the boys from more serious matters. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions now, happy to open things up. Oh, thank you.